we have about uh, eight slides to get through, and I want to just uh, give a brief introduction about structure and divisions of the biblical text. So as you're going to uh, study any given passage, you need to know where does this uh, particular verse uh, story fit within the biblical genre of scripture. So let's just uh, look together and hopefully this will make sense. Now, one of the things uh, before I move the slide, you'll note that in your Bible, you'll see chapters and you'll see verses uh, with a number. And so um, people wonder, how did that arrive? Was that part of the biblical text? And just simply no. Um, when we look at the original, what we would have as original or copies of original manuscripts, they're missing uh, verses and chapters, and this was later added as the translation work uh, began uh, in Latin and eventually as the English text uh, came into existence. So uh, let's just uh, look at some of the history behind it, and hopefully th this will just serve as a, a reminder uh, of what we have is the, is the biblical text. And um, again, we're thankful for men and women of old who have helped uh, shape uh, our English text as we have it today, and we're, we're able to make sense of it. We can read God's word on a, on a daily basis. So here's the history and division. Uh, chapter divisions were drafted by uh, Stephen Langston, Archbishop of Canterbury. And then later on, um, it was uh, Robert Stephanos of Paris, who began to actually put divisions around um, the biblical text, whether old or into the new. And then by the time his 1555 um, edition came out, uh, we, we actually begin to see those first divisions being applied uh, within our English text. Um, now, there's some strengths and weaknesses as we think about whether there should be uh, verses or chapters. Just so you know, you can purchase an English text without verse divisions. They're, they're available and, and they can be helpful because they simply provide the the content and there as a reader, you can go through and begin to analyze the words and, and sentence structure uh, found for that particular uh, section of, of, of the Bible. But nonetheless, I'm thankful for chapters, I'm thankful for verses and, and um, sometimes verses, uh, when there's a number there, you can remember numbers attached to verses. And we also see how the translation committee uh, divided paragraphs and sections, so we see the logical order of, of a text. And so, it, again, it's helpful to see the, the natural reading where our, uh, our eyes transition between a, a body of text where now it's broken into parts and pieces. So we can either slow down in our reading, begin to see the, the full effect of what maybe the author is uh, communicating to the writer or this uh, case, the, the readers of that of that era. And again, logical flow comes from it as we naturally read uh, the scripture because there's spacing between the paragraphs. Now there are units of thought. So when you um, examine any biblical uh, text, you're looking at sentence structure. Uh, you wanna make note of what the uh, original Hebrew and Greek had in mind as it was uh, um, revealing to us these these uh, biblical chapters and, and what we would know as verses today. And of course, every writing has paragraphs, just like as we, if we were going to write an English um, letter uh, or a project for a class. You have sentences, you have paragraphs, and you might even have what we would call divisions or, or chapters. Uh, eventually, if you pursue masterwork or doctoral work, you'll have to write a, uh, an extended project that is uh, divided into chapters. And then we have the content called a book. The book uh, is sentences, paragraphs, and chapters flowing into one uh, central idea or thought. Might have multiple applications from it, but we have books and you're required to read books and um, your uh, bookshelves are probably full of them as you see it. But that's the idea here of the Bible. The Bible is filled with a lot of books as we know it, with chapters, with verses and sections. And each of those sections might have a key idea, thought, trajectory in which uh, it is uh, sending the reader toward. And uh, so that's where we're heading in this little mini lecture for our class this week. And of course, all uh, subjects have certain divisions, as I've already said. The author's intent is to communicate a certain theme or thematic structure 
uh, puts uh, thought to it. And especially as you look at Old Testament narrative, there's often imagery and metaphors, uh, concepts that maybe uh, we're not familiar with, objects uh, such as in the Old Testament tabernacle system, the law, priestly duties um, and such, and festival and harvest seasons. These are important um, stoppers along the way, markers that help the reader say, okay, I need to know some more about um, the images that the author is using in order to make sense of the reading or the verses that I'm studying. And so some books, uh, as you might know, will have multiple themes. You can't pinpoint that this is the central theme of any given book. Now, if you get into the book of Romans, you might find a central verse, such as the, in chapter one, the just shall live by faith, or you see the repeated theme of the righteousness of God being made known uh, to the world. And so you're looking for those, again, those markers or, or those structural components to help uh, you pause, slow down in your reading, examine the biblical text for what it is, and then formulate um, your key theological thought. So here are some helpful steps for you, the reader, as you work through uh, any Bible study or message preparation. Look at your major transitions. And so you're looking for those important, we would say in English, our English um, transitional words, so and but and that. And again, these are prepositions uh, that allow us to break up a sentence and structure our, our thoughts around. Uh, we're moving now to the next section or next uh, thought about our subject area. And of course, you should identify those topical sta um, statements. Um, maybe he is mentioning love right now and love is the central theme of this particular chapter. Or as you look at Paul's writing, uh, he loves to talk about grace and mercy, God's righteousness, our righteousness uh, uh, in, in him. And so then you examine those related subjects uh, within within the writing of that text and begin to formulate, okay, this seems to be what the author is saying. Or if you're looking at the gospel account, John's gospel, he's making known the truth, he's writing it plainly, uh, and then he begins to wrap. Um, this is this is the intent that you would know the truth. Later on, he emphasizes that in his epistle or his letters to uh, the churches as well. Now, uh, any book has what we call units of thought. These are the paragraphs I've already mentioned in the previous slides. And again, it's helpful that our English translations divide our biblical texts into paragraphs. We're able to see from the translator uh, maybe where the break is in the original text. Often found the NASB very helpful or the Legacy Standard Bible is helpful in dividing the paragraphs um, therein. Now, NIV provides uh, so then uh, as a marker for new ideas uh, in your translation. So it's good to look at those um, modern way of uh, referencing those uh, divisions within uh, the biblical text. Lastly, I think you should be asking the big question or the idea, uh, where does the idea begin in this uh, particular paragraph? Do we see a transitional marker here? Do we see parenthetical thought? Uh, again, these are all uh, important parts of Bible study of just simply observing the text and asking who, what, when, where, and why. Now, individual statements is what we would call the sentence structure of it. We know that a single, uh, that as you look at a sentence, uh, it's it's a grammatical thought and it is uh, it has that subject and predicate. Um, or another way of looking at a sentence is uh, it has a subject and it has a um, complement attached to it. Therefore, we have a sentence. And so, um, sometimes in a biblical text, we might not know where the end thought might come and a new thought begins. So for example, in Ephesians chapter one, verse uh, four through five, for he chose us in him before the, uh, before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in sight in love. And then we have a period. He predestined us to be adopted as his sons through Jesus Christ. Or you have another translation, English translation that says this way, he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight, period. Notice the difference. In love, he predestined. So it, it's attaching um, two subjects there or two sentences to equal one thought. So uh, where does in love then ultimately go? And that's a, a good observation question. So if you're studying this passage for a Bible study, 
or message prep, you might have two subject or two sentences that you're going to examine and expound on at that point. Again, um, is both wrong or one right? I, I think this is where you have to uh, do the exegetical work and discover um, the, the work of Christ. It's both theological as well. In love, he predestined. So he chose us on the basis of his love. So I may go with that second translation as a means to understanding. Again, if I take the first translation, um, where where is it? Um, where is the focus? Well, the focus is is um, I'm blameless in his sight in love. So in the basis of Christ's love, I'm found um, holy and acceptable to the Lord. Or my election is based on his love or his electing sovereign um, grace to call me into uh, his uh, his kingdom or into his family. So notice the, the tensions there theologically, and you'll have to uh, wrestle through that. So where does love go? Uh, it depends on how you observe, and also your theological uh, basis may come in and um, not cause tension, though that's probably a good word to use. There is tension there, but you will arrive at your singular theological um, uh, meaning of the text based on how you divide the sentence up um, from both the Greek and even as you see in, in the English text. So lastly, as we think about uh, slide number eight here, just know that the that there are various sections of, of the scripture. Of course, you have the Pentateuch. Uh, you, you have the historical books that give the this, the section of the history of the nation of Israel. Go back to the Pentateuch, it's simply the law, the God giving the law to the nation. We have the section on the prophets, both major and minor. Uh, nothing, um, don't focus on major and minor, but that these are the, the, the prophets. They're, they're giving something about, about the, the time period in which the nation of Israel is living, and they're giving us a window into the future. And the gospels are the record of the life of Jesus, his ministry, his death, his burial and resurrection. And of course, you have then even the short little narrative of history of the book of Acts, of the story of the church, Luke uh, writing the second volume of his gospel uh, about the early church and the, the development and the expanse of Christianity in Asia Minor. And then you have the epistles, various writings of Paul and uh, Peter and James and John. And finally, the book of Revelation is um, the end cap of what uh, Genesis reveals, now the final book. And so you have these two bookends that communicate God's redemptive working plan throughout time. And each of the letters and each of the books and sections have their particular trajectory in which um, they're taking the reader along the way to reveal um, the wonderful work of Jesus Christ from Old Testament into the New. And we look forward to his return as uh, readers of the Bible. And so hopefully that encourages you to think through the different sections and sentences and divisions as you see it. And maybe you've learned something uh, new or been acquainted again to what you already know, and it can reapply it for your Bible studies and biblical messages that the Lord will allow you to uh, communicate to others.